to our 10 o'clock. If this is your first time, we welcome you on behalf of our pastors. And we pray that you open your hearts today. I tell you, church, you guys are in for a treat. The word is awesome. It's in season. If, if you're able, please rise to your feet. Raise your hands. Lift them up. Father, we worship you. We glorify you, Jesus. Father God, it doesn't matter who wins the Super Bowl today. You are the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore, Father. And we worship you. We thank you for the word that we're going to receive today, Lord. Open our hearts, Father, so that we may receive it wholeheartedly. In your name, everybody shout. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Super Soul Sunday, Woo! where we are automatically on the winning team. Amen. It doesn't matter what team you have, football team, whatever. We are on God's team. And today we need a revival. Say revival. Revival. Put your hands together like this. Let's have a great time in God's presence. Amen. Amen. Team, you ready? ready. One, ready. two, three, set. Come on.
you glad we praise the God that's still the same today, yesterday, and forevermore? The same God! We're gonna keep it going. Come on! Put your hands together like this. Worshippers in the house say No other name that can save, deliver, and restore. Wonderful, wonderful. 
so good. I know you feel his presence because he is here this morning. Amen. Wow. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Jesus. Your people, we're here, Father God, before you. We're here to worship you, adore you, thank you, and give you praise, Father. Thank you for your presence. Flood this place, Father. Continue to be with us as we cry out to you. We thank you, God.
to be the same God today, Father. We worship you. Thank you that miracles still happen today.
give us the mighty word that we need to hear, Father God. More of you, less of us. We give you praise, glory, and honor. And all of God's children say, Amen, amen, amen. High five your neighbor this morning. And welcome, Pastor Joe. Let's give our worship team a big round of applause. I don't know about you, but I so appreciate our worship team and all that they do to usher us into the presence of God. You know, you cannot sing a song like that that speaks of miracles and how God is the same way and yet not move on. And so I want to pray right now for some of us who might be believing for a miracle. Now, we, we keep talking about, we, we rather use wisdom um, than always needing God to give us miracles. But we live in a broken world. We live in a world that is broken. And we ourselves are broken. So because of imperfections and insufficiencies that we get to face every day, sometimes we things happen, right? You get news that you never expected, and all of a sudden, you're having to deal with it. Some of us, it might be a relationship that went south, and your heart is hurting, you're, 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 you're mad, you're angry, and yet you need God to intervene. So I want to pray for some of us who are believing God for that, and even for those of us who are believing God for a miracle in our bodies, that uh, maybe you got a report recently that things aren't working the way it should work, and and um, so I want to believe God. And you're going to find in this teaching series, we're going to be moving more and more, and we're going to see miraculous things happen in our church. Uh, prior to chapter 5, 6, and 7, before and after Jesus went about his business performing signs and wonders all over the place. And then, and then you hear a song like this, you can't just move on to business. Come on, you, know, you know what I'm saying? You have to respond. You have to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to move. So for those of us who are believing for a miracle, you need a miracle. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor because I want to pray for you. All right? And sometimes it just takes that, that bold step for God to meet you to see that miracle happen. So if, if that's you right now, you need a miracle somewhere, fashion, stand to your feet when I count to three. One, two, three, stand to your feet. Lord, you see, you see those that are standing and perhaps some that are tentative right now. They don't want to be embarrassed, but the, in our church, you don't have to be embarrassed because none of us have gotten anything together. We all are dependent on you. We all rely on you. And I'm grateful for the transparency that is here in our service. That, Lord God, that when we stand to our feet, we're saying, God, I need you. I get, uh, God, I need you now. The God of Jacob, the God of Moses, the God of Mary. Lord, we need you now. In the same way you performed signs and wonders in the past, thousands of years ago, you're still able to perform those miracles even now. And so, Lord God, we pray right now in Jesus' name. You see, Father, every single need, and, and all the needs may be different, some similar, but Lord, they're, they're standing before you crying out for your miracle. And so in the name of Jesus, we pray for miracles, signs and wonders that will go forth right now and being released right now. Just begin to receive that. Begin to receive God's miracle power. By faith, I receive. I myself receive. I receive your miracle power, Lord God. I believe, Lord God, that you're working behind the scenes and you're doing things in my life that I don't even understand, that I don't even see, but Lord, I trust you. And I trust you, Lord God, that you will cause things to work together for the good of us and our families. And so, Lord, I pray your blessing and I pray your miracles to be manifested in Jesus' name. You receive that? Amen. You receive that? Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand. In. Amen. Since you're standing, let me get into this reading. And if you're, if you have... If your pain level went from 9 to 4 or from 8 to 5 and you feel like you've been relieved of some pain, uh, can you just kind of wave your hands like this? Man, that's me. I, I just received something. Anybody? Right here? Good. Anybody else? 
I'll, 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 can I let you in on something? I could never lift up my right hand like this, okay? I had nerve damage here, and I was just lifting my hand as I was worshiping there. But as soon as I sang that song, the faith level in me, he's just like, oh, get out, I can. God is so good. Maybe my golf game will improve now. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, reads like this. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. Father, as we get into your word, give us divine revelation. Open up our eyes so that we can see that which you want to speak to our hearts right now. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Amen. Now, there's a special presence of God in the place this, uh, this morning. Maybe it's the expectation of the Super Bowl. Um, you notice I'm wearing red only because it's Valentine's Day. And... And not only because the Cowboy, I mean the, the 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 49ers aren't playing the Super Bowl, so um, so I'm repping my red today, which, by the way, is my favorite color. The yeah, I am a contrarian. I love red, but yet I love the Cowboys. So anyway, um, this morning's reading, as we get into the Beatitudes this morning, this message is entitled "Foundational Attitudes for a Blessed Life." foundational attitudes for a blessed life. So this teaching, I'm going I'm I'm to tell you right now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow your mind. It's going to come totally different from what you thought. You were th expecting a fastball, but this is coming, there's a curveball that is about to come, all right, that's going to shock some of us because some of us might have learned a little bit different. But because we do hermeneutics and exegetical process, come on, somebody, we all fancy like that. We're learning the word that the, understand that when the multitudes went up on a mountain, when Matthew, who's the writer here, now understand Matthew was a tax collector. He was the despised person in his community. But then he became a follower of Christ. So much so that even when Jesus died, he became a missionary to the nation of Persia, and he even went as far south to Ethiopia. And he actually got killed for being, and being a martyr. For his faith in Jesus. So when he writes this book, he's actually writing to the Jewish people and he understands the intellect and the mindset of the Jewish people. And so he says he this is multitude of people that follow Jesus because Jesus was performing signs and wonders all over the town. And so they follow him up this mountain. Now that that's a big deal to Jewish people because, because they remember that the last prophet that went up the mountain was a guy named Moses. And when he came down the mountain, he came with these things called the commandments, the thou shall nots, ten of them, thou shall nots. And yet the author tells us here that Jesus goes up on a mountain. That is significant to the Jewish people, very significant. Now, it's not that the mountain was significant because the mountain was really more of a, 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 a mound, right? But it was a mountain of a sermon that he began to preach. And Jesus began to, instead of saying the, the thou shalt not, he comes and says, blessed are those. Come on, somebody. I'm so glad Jesus came. <laughs> Tell me not what to do. But instead, he says, blessed are those. And then he begins to speak. Now understand, when he's preaching, he's not preaching to the thousands. He's actually preaching to his disciples. Similar to what when we first started two years ago with our TV ministry, like many churches around the world, all of a sudden we can't meet together, and all of a sudden we were having to uh, get on social media and get our video team going. Um, I never thought in my mind that we would ever get one. I, I never wanted one. But then we wanted to communicate with our people, and so interesting, I was in a meeting with a bunch of pastors, and they felt that they had to change their music, and they had to change the way they preached, and they had to alter everything because they wanted to speak to the masses. And yet there was a few contrarians of us that said, wait a minute. I, the only reason why we're doing TV is for our church. Yeah. We got people that have moved to the mainland who still consider us their church. So we're actually doing that for them and doing that for our families and, and perhaps their family and friends. But I'm not trying to attract everybody. Now, if they get blessed with our message, hallelujah. 
But our goal is to reach our people. And Jesus, in speaking here on the mountain, is actually speaking to his disciples. And he understands that there's a lot of people listening in. But his focus was, if I can get these 12, if I can get these 12 radical, come on, somebody, the crowd will get it as well. And so the first B attitude, and there's eight of them. And so I looked at it, if I, I have to average three minutes per B attitude, <laughs> if I'm going to cover all eight. And so I'm going to do my best. Uh, I told my wife, if I was do this again, I would have preached four last week and four this week. But you're going to get all eight this week, all right? And right before the Super Bowl. <laughs> Amen. So the first beatitude is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, understand the beatitudes wasn't a, in a, a ethical principle teaching for you to follow in your life. Jesus didn't present it like this was some oracle, something that, that will make your life better. Actually, Jesus was a contrarian. He was, he was a counterculture kind of guy. And remember last week we talked about the four different uh, type of Jewish people that were there, traditionalists, liberalists. You got the separatists, and then you get the radicals. Come on, somebody. We talked about that last week. And interesting, it identifies with us and relates to us today that we got sort of the same four groups too, mm. Right? And in those four groups, you got factions in those four groups. And yet Jesus actually, when he preached this, because he wanted to explode every single doctrine, every belief that they came with, every predisposition that they had in their hearts and their minds, Jesus was going to explode and bring those things down. First one is poor in spirit. Wait a minute, man. Poor in spirit? Now, he's not talking about being poor. He's actually saying poor in spirit. Now, a lot of people don't really understand it, but this is the key. This is the foundation of having a relationship with the king. If you want to have a relationship with Jesus, you got to understand you have to be poor in spirit, not poor in the flesh, poor in spirit. What does that mean? Poor in spirit is understanding that it doesn't matter my title. It doesn't matter how much money I got in the bank. It doesn't, how many, it doesn't matter how many cars I have in the garage. It doesn't matter my status or my position in the community. It does not matter. It's those who are poor in spirit, who understand that there is absolutely nothing inside of them. There is nothing inside of them that, that can even qualify to have a relationship with God. They understand they're spiritually bankrupt. They, they, they're inadequate. They're insufficient in who they are. Well, this is where the word of faith was. Well, yeah, but pastor, well, what about our, our identity in Christ Jesus? Yes, that's good. It's good to know who you are in Christ, Christ Jesus. We should know who we are and whose we are. Come on, somebody say amen. But if you don't know who you're not, then you're going to be out of balance. See, it's like having a, a, being a wealthy person. And, and I had a friend who was a very wealthy person, told every one of their kids, you will not receive any money from me when I die. He's a wealthy man. You will not receive any money from me. I, all my money is going to go to missions. It's going to go to building and planting churches. Well, what's up with that? He said, no, you're going to have to use your own faith. And yet every single one of the kids became wealthy too. Because, see, if you only learn who you are in Christ and the benefits you have and not realize that you're absolutely nothing, you're absolutely, you can actually be disgusting with all your sins. And you bring nothing to the table. The problem is we compare ourselves to each other, right? Don't we do that? Yeah, well, you know, at least you know, my posts are more religious. <laughs> or, or, you know, I don't flip off anybody in traffic. And so you compare yourself to one another. You say, at least I'm not like my friend, or at least I'm not like that other student or another, that other athlete, because I'm better. And so we think that by, if we're spiritual long jumpers, they, just because I jump five feet longer than you, that you're actually going to get to the other side. And yet if we were to actually try to long jump from one side of the Grand Canyon to the other side of the Grand Canyon, how many you know all of us fall short? We all fall short. I don't care how talented and gifted you are. You will fall short. And so it is for those who, are, who recognize their poor in spirit. See, it's those who are poor in spirit that will be part of the kingdom of God. 
that the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Why? Because they have recognized that apart from Christ Jesus, I am absolutely nothing. I am I am dirtbag. I'm scum of the earth apart from Christ. I have nothing in me that can ever connect with a holy God. See, when you start off that way and you have that humility in your faith, knowing that, man, yeah, I know who I am. I know the benefit. I'm an overcomer. I know I'm the righteousness of God. I know all that. I know that. But you know what? I know this too, that my faith is based on the fact that, that without Christ, I am absolutely nothing. Jesus talked about two men that went to pray at the temple. One was a tax collector. The other one actually was a Pharisee. And we talked about the Pharisees were, were traditionalists. And they were very well respected by the people because they were like, man, these are the guys that are closest to God. They're close to God. And the Pharisee went to the temple. Jesus is explaining this story. He said he went to the temple and he, and he said, you know, Jesus, he said, God, I'm so glad that I'm not like that tax collector. That, Lord, I pay my tithes, I give, I read my word, I go to church. Lord, I'm so grateful. And then Jesus says, and then there was the other man who was a tax collector that was despised. Everybody hated him because they cheated people from their, of their money. And he, when he went in the temple, he stayed way in the back. He couldn't come to the front. Barely lifted his hands. Couldn't even lift his eyes up. He said, Lord, I am a sinner. And Jesus says, who was justified in that temple that day? It wasn't the Pharisee. It was the one that realized, said, man, I am nothing. Who am I to even come before a living God and a living king? Jesus said, that's why I give grace to the humble and to the proud I resist the proud. You want to be rich in God? Be poor in spirit. Second one. You guys getting something out of this? Second beatitude is the blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. This beatitude is the foundation of repentance. This is where we, we go from, from understanding that we're nothing without Christ, right? And apart from his grace and apart from him, we're absolutely nothing, but because we're connected with him, we understand as well that we live in a broken world. And we grieve and we lament that we're broken ourselves. I don't know about you, but when I watch the news, and I tend to try not to watch it a lot, it's just bad news. And I don't know about you, but it, it breaks my heart. It, at times, there's, you know, we can get very, um, you can get so used to it that you become desensitized to what's actually happening around us. And yet it's so easy to find out that, man, our, our world is broken. And it's because of sin. And as Christians, part of it is to, to mourn and to cry out to God that, God, we need you. And we so need you. I cry out every time when I see what's happening in our nation and how so divided we are as a nation. And not just our nation, but even in our churches. Everybody's trying to outdo each other. And I tell people, just do you. Just be you. We're going to be destiny. I can't be Mike Kai. I can't be Dave Barr. I can't be Art Sepulveda. I can't be anybody else except Joe Onosai. I be you. But I mourn the fact that sometimes I, I want to do some stupid stuff. When I get offended, there's a brokenness in me. They want to get my bow and arrow. <laughs> Some of you know I love archery and just. <laughs> <laughs> but see, this is where Jesus challenges every one of us, right? And th yet, this is the way of the kingdom that if you don't mourn, you won't get comforted. You don't repent, you won't receive forgiveness. The only way comfort come and forgiveness come is by way of repentance. And repentance comes as we mourn and we grieve. I grieve. I grieve. Sometimes I make some of the most stupid decisions. Sometimes I got the worst attitude. I, I mean, this is the 42nd year that my wife is the, my valentine. I mean, I was five years old when I started dating my wife. 
And, and, and yet, you know, I'll post that on my social media story, right? You know, my Valentine since 1980. It's a long time. But if I was to tell you what happened to those 42 years, I wasn't the nicest guy. And yet I know that some of us know that there's, we can try to put a facade up and get inside of us. We know that there's struggles, there's pain. You see, when we mourn, comfort comes. Stop the person next to you telling me, you better start mourning us, I'll make you mourn right now. <laughs> you, get the, you get that? You want to be happy? God will bring comfort to the mourners. The third one is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is the beatitude, the foundation for our faith. The foundation of our faith is based on meekness. Everybody say meekness. Understand that meekness is not weakness. Yeah? Meekness is a wild stallion or a wild bronco, since Natulu is over here, uh, a wild bronco <laughs> that has been tamed. And, 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 and it, it doesn't, it, it can't be used. It's going to be running wild because it has to be domesticated. And it must be tamed. It must submit its will to the owner and to the master before it gets used. And yet sometimes we think God going to use me, and yet, have you submitted? Because God can only ride a horse that has been submitted and has been surrendered unto him. See, that's meekness. Meekness is being able to get people tell you all kinds of bad things, and yet just smile. Meekness is being able to, to, to know where you're at, and you're happy where you're at and you're not needing to flaunt anything to try to get people's attention because you're meek. See, meekness is not weakness. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not there. I need more meekness in my life. Sometimes, oh, Pastor Joe, you're so humble. Oh. <laughs> you really think so? My wife can tell you some stories, all right? <laughs> and, and, and so the thing is meet this after you've been poor in spirit and if you've mourned there's a meekness that comes I know, I, I know that I'm, I'm more meek now than I've been when I was in my 20s uh, if you're in your 20s I'm not saying that you're not meek okay? I'm, ju I'm just saying me okay? some of you guys are more mature than I was when I was 40 <laughs> okay so I'm just saying that that meekness comes out of humility. And it's being able to, to be happy with where you're at. Not satisfied. You want, you want God's best. But you're content. You're, there's this peace about you that you're not in a hurry, that you're not trying to, to outdo anybody. That's, that seems to be kind of the, the culture we grow up in now is that I'm competing and comparing myself to you. That, that I want to make sure you know that I'm never sad. You notice that we hardly post anything on social media that makes us look bad? We're always going to take the option that makes us look the best because that's our lack of meekness. Perhaps our weakness. Praise God, God's grace and mercy is with us. I'm so grateful that he gives us his teachings and yet he knows that without him and without his grace and without his power of the Holy Spirit, you're unable to perform these things. Somebody say, thank you for meekness. Some of us might, who are students, you know that some of this meekness part who inherit the earth actually has something to do also with eschatological theology, which the time will come when Jesus will return and that he will conquer for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom here on earth. And we as believers will inherit the earth. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Then the fourth one is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be filled. See, the beat this beatitude is the foundation for Christian living and sanctification. What are you hungry for? Because if you're not hungry for righteousness, you're going to be hungry for something else. See, Lucifer, which was 
one of God's greatest creations, the Bible says. This guy was so talented, talented in himself, he had the entire worship team. He was a gifted musician, and yet it got to the point, it got to his head, and he says, man, I shall be like God. See, he was power hungry. King Nebuchadnezzar was praise hungry. He built this big golden statue, and everywhere the statue went, if you were there and you saw the statue, as soon as he played the national music and, and the, the Hare Krishna music went on, you had to bow down. He was praise hungry. There was a guy who was a rich farmer whose barns were so filled, the harvest was so plentiful, he filled up his entire barns. Instead of sharing some of the, the extra and the excess with some of his neighbors and some of the other people that who were poor, instead he kept everything and he broke down the barn to build bigger barns. See, he was possession hungry. Nothing wrong with possessions, but when you become possession hungry, you'll find that there is a bottomless pit that you will never ever feel. He was, Solomon was pleasure hungry. King Solomon was so wealthy that the Bible says that silver was like dirt. <laughs> you imagine that? That you're so wealthy, man, that, that, that you have gardens and you have pools and you have all these buildings that are built on your behalf. He had all the wives, man. I can, handle, I can hardly handle one. Can you imagine try a hundred wives and a hundred concubines? He was hungry for pleasure. And yet the Bible says that Solomon himself says, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. The prodigal son was popularity hungry. He wanted his inheritance. He saw how all his friends were having fun out there in the world. And he says, man, I'm going to take my inheritance, and I'm, I, I'm thirsting, I'm hungering for the world. So I'm going to get out there and get popular myself. We must desire to pursue righteousness. Righteousness, the way of doing and doing right. It is he who knew no sin became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You want to be happy? Pursue righteousness. Hunger for and thirst for righteousness. Number five, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. This beatitude is the foundation for Christian relationships. Hey, listen, you're going to be disappointed in relationships. You're going to get offended in relationships, in friendships, in um, in, 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 in your marriage, your boyfriend, girlfriend, there's going to be fights. If I fight with the very person that I really, really love, number one person I love in the, in the whole planet, if I fight with her, guess what? I'm probably going to fight with some of you. And yet if I don't realize that every relationship has been given by God, and that, I, that the same way God gave mercy to me, that I'm to show mercy to others. If you're not merciful, you will not receive mercy. It's only those who give mercy that get mercy. I don't know about you, but grace and mercy is different. Grace is receiving something that you don't deserve. Mercy is deserving something, but not receiving. We deserve hell. We deserve punishment. We deserve death. And yet God withheld that because he showed you mercy. How many people here God showed mercy to? So be merciful. Lamentations 3 tells us, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So if he renews mercy, we need to renew mercy. Number six, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This beatitude is the foundation of Christian worship. That whenever, as a believer, we're to make sure to guard our hearts, to make sure that it's pure. Now, the only way it's 100% pure is because of the blood of Jesus. Come on, somebody. To the forgiveness of sin. We live in an imperfect world, and you're imperfect yourself, so it's going to get contaminated. But just like we talked about last week, with that old man taking care of the springs, we need to be that old man taking care of and pulling out all the junk 
and the clutter from the springs so that our hearts are well. Somebody say amen. amen. Make sure your heart is pure. I'm going fast because time's coming up. Number seven, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. This beatitude is the foundation for Christian mission. I know that as a believer that many times we think being a believer is just all about coming to church. And then coming to church, it's all about just feeling good, receiving the word, and then go home, go about your business. But you know that there's a mission upon our lives? You know that there's an assignment upon Christians? That there's a mission that God wants us to be a part of and embrace? And that is to bring peace into the homes of your loved ones and your friends who don't know him. The Bible says if you're a lover of the world, and most of our people who don't know God, they're lovers of the world. They don't know anything else. And that means the Bible says that they're enemies of God. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be an enemy of God. I used to be an enemy of God, but I'm grateful for those that prayed for me and prayed me into the kingdom. So now my job as a missionary to, to my people and to the people and the community is to bring peace. Slap the person next to you tell them, man, you better bring some peace. Don't, don't bring the piece of trash and the piece of your opinion. Bring, bring God. Bring, bring God. Okay, so there's a mission. And then the final beatitude is, and like I said, I'm not doing justice to a lot of these. I'm kind of giving you quickly. The beatitude is the, uh, blessed are the persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and great is your reward in heaven. This beatitude is the foundation for Christian perseverance. If you are a believer, you're going to get persecuted. Guarantee, automatic forbearance. Okay, you're going to get persecuted. Amen. Amen. Some of you guys remember, knew the story that when I went, from, went to preach in Wuhan, China, that there was about 170 men, and you're, no, you're only allowed to have 25 people gathered together for a religious service. We had 170 something. And all these men came from all over China, and all these men were actually small group leaders, and every one of them had over a thousand small groups to themselves. And I'm telling myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> These guys are mega church pastors that are being persecuted. The thing that got me the most, I mean, I love, I, I love when I go to different countries, and we praise God we've been able to do that, and I love seeing people worship in their language, and I, see, I love seeing them just engrossed in worship. When I watch the Chinese men worship, Brought tears to my eyes. These are supposed to be my enemies. <laughs> our nation says the Chinese are our enemies. And I look at them, they love the same God that I love. And yet they get persecuted by their own government. And when we took a shower, it was a community shower, and we were looking at one another, and I'm looking at them, every single one of them has scars all over their bodies. And they're looking at each other and comparing, and they're laughing. They say, yeah, I got this when I was in service. Siberia. I got this in, when I was in prison. And they're comparing all these scars. Why? Because they were persecuted. You're going to be persecuted. And if you're not being persecuted, and sometimes it's hard to be persecuted here in Hawaii, in America. But sometimes we don't, when we don't take a stand for our beliefs, perhaps we're trying to be too much of a friend to the world and not make a stand for Christ. So this is the kingdom of God. Totally contradicting of what I thought was the kingdom of God. Everything was a paradox. And that's why these men, these Jewish people, they were so mad at Jesus, they ended up killing Jesus. Because he didn't preach what the people wanted to hear. Father, I pray, Lord God, as we've heard the Beatitudes this morning, this is the kingdom. And Lord, it's, it's, everything has to do with the inside of us. Lord, I pray as we journey through this series, as we prepare for being salt and light next week, Father, I pray, Lord God, that in this journey, that you would help us, Lord God, to renovate and deconstruct and then construct some things in our hearts that perhaps that are not there. But, Lord, we are so grateful for your word. We're so grateful, Father God, that you challenge us. 
You challenge us according to your word. And Lord, I pray, Father God, this, that we will be, as a Destiny Christian Church, we will be contrarians. That we will be able to live the life that Jesus said we can live, even in a world that rejects you. Lord, we love you, and we're so grateful for you. Empower your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hello. We're going to talk about this. How many people enjoyed that message? I mean, I love the fact that Jesus is telling his disciples, he's talking to them, and he's telling them, this is who you need to be. This is what you need to do. And it's not being popular with the world. It's being good with God. And too often, that's where we're at. We're trying to be popular with the world, even if it means being an enemy of God. And we can't do that. You need to be comfortable with who you are. You know, earlier, Pastor Joe was talking about social. I'm not a social media person. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not with MySpace. I'm not, none of those things. I have those accounts. And so when something is going on, somebody's birthday or whatever, and I always get people to pass that. How come you're the only pastor that don't put anything on? I don't need, I don't need public acknowledgement. If you in my circle, trust me, you will be contacted by me personally, giving you greetings. The people in my circle know I care. If you just want a public acknowledgement from me, that means you're not in my circle and you don't really know that I care. And I'm good with that because I'm comfortable with who I am and whose I am. And that's the world that God is telling us. We got to live that way because the world is pretty cruel. They want us to be their friend, but sometimes that means that we got to go against God's word. Like right about now, how many excited givers do we have in God's house? If you give and using our mobile giving app, it's 77977-DCC-Hawaii. You can also utilize our text giving, which is the same, a little bit faster. We still do checks, cash, and envelopes. If you're using them, put your name up on it. Drop it up in one of the boxes on your way out the door so that you can receive proper credit for it. You know, today is that day. Rob is trying to get out the church right this moment, but today is that day, Super Bowl. And as it was, I was following this thing. See, I, I got a liking for Joe Burrow because he played at LSU. And he had this young wide receiver with him now, Chase, who also played at LSU. And it was telling their story leading up to this point. And one of the things that they said was when Chase first went to LSU, Joe Burrow took him and began to work with him to teach him how to study film to get better at the things he do. And then they began to work out together so that they can get better at the things that they do. Because Joe Burrow, remember what somebody did to him, and he turned around and he'd do it with somebody else. And the, the boat guy said, we play this game from our heart. Everything that we do, it comes from our heart. So then Joe Burrow gets, he gets drafted, and then the next year, Chase get drafted to the same team. And when Chase went to Cincinnati, he went to the neighborhood where Joe Burrow lived now. And he knocked on every door, offering to pay more money than the house was worth so that he can get a house close to his quarterback who continues to educate him and help him to grow. And I started thinking, if they can play a game and be all in with their heart, how many of us are all in with God? How many of us know that coming to church is not the only answer? But there's other things that we need to do as children of God. How many of us do this walk with God with all our heart? Because that part-time Christian don't get you into heaven. You all in or you will be all out. Matthew chapter 6 says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth can eat them and rust can destroy them. 
and where thieves could break in and steal. Store up treasures in heaven, where moth and rust cannot destroy, and the thieves cannot break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there also is your heart. Does your heart belong to God? Is it about your time, your talent, and your treasure that I'm going to give to God? See, we tend to give God what's left rather than our very best. I'm glad that I serve a God that don't think the way we think. Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave the very best that heaven had to offer. How many excited givers do we have in God's house? Father, we thank you as we come to this part of the service where we get to worship you. We get to honor you, Father God, in our giving. We understand, Lord, that all that we have and all that we are, it comes from you. And we want to use it each and every day as we continue to edify, to glorify, and to magnify your name. So take the tithes, take the offering, use them, Lord, as you see fit. I thank you, Lord, that this is the church that don't let circumstances or situations keep them from being obedient to your word in its entirety. Thank you for this time, moment, and opportunity. In the mighty name of Jesus, the church in agreement, say. A couple of admin notes for you before... Wait, wait, Rob. Come back this way. A couple of admin notes for you. After the service, Joanne, get him. After the service, take him in the back. There's a photo booth. Take some pictures of your loved one. Right? Take some pictures with your loved one for Valentine's Day and enjoy. Now, I need to tell y'all something. Forgive our worship team, especially the ones that had on all that red. They're confused. They still think their team is playing today. So they came in all bombarded. Your team ain't playing. We understand that, right? So just remember those things. Also, everybody say next Saturday. Next Saturday, we are doing the outreach with the uh, Hawaii Food Bank and, and partnering up with some of the churches out there in Ever Beach. If you're going to be out there, short call time is between 6.30 and 7.30 a.m. So we, I mean 7 a.m. So we can get things going between 6.30 and 7 a.m. Make sure that you have your hair pulled back. I will have my hair in a bun. Make sure you have your hair pulled back. Make sure that you don't come in there with your slippers on. Closed toe shoes. So that you can feed the people. And make sure that your heart is right. As we do in God's work. Amen. All jokes aside, you know, we are looking to just continue to grow things and do things the way God wants us to do. And we want you to understand that coming to church is not the only answer. It's one of those things. But we want you to come to church. We want you to get involved. We want you to be faithful in the connect group. We want you to be faithful with your tithing. We want you to serve so you can do God's work. Did I lose Rob yet? Stand on your feet so Rob can get out of here. <laughs> I love Rob. I'm a, you know I'm going to mess with him later on. <laughs> Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Father, for such a powerful message on the Beatitudes. Teaching us, shaping us, molding us on how we need to conduct ourselves. How we need to be, Father. So now that your people have been equipped, and now that they have been encouraged, Father, we send them out here to live a victorious life, not just to hear your word, but to live it out every single day, to be salt and to be light in a dying world. So bless your people, keep us all safe. And until we can all come back together again, we give you and only you all of the praises, all of the honor, and all of the glory that you so rightfully deserve. In the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus, the church in agreement say, go in peace. We'll see you next week.